guys, welcome to the tiny house. Today we're going to be doing a practice where I incorporate some of the anatomical language of movement into the practice. Now, this is not the language that you would use when you're teaching a normal class, but this is the language that we need to understand as yoga teachers so that we can read scientific information and get more into movement science and let that inform the way that we teach as yoga teachers. A lot of times people find this to be a little bit dry to study, so since most yoga teachers are very movement-based and in touch with their body, kinesthetic learning usually works better. So that means moving and maybe saying the terms out loud as you do the movements, and that will really help the information to gel in your mind and become something that you can use on a regular basis. This is also the first practice that I'm doing with my lovely new cork yoga mat. I've wanted a cork yoga mat for a while now, and this one I really like because of the lines on it to help with placement and to make sure that you're centered. And I think that's going to be a really nice thing for this anatomically based yoga practice. If you're interested in getting a cork yoga mat, I'll leave a link in the description below with a coupon code that you can use. We'll start in a comfortable position down on your mat or maybe sitting in a chair to talk about the cervical spine, the neck. And we'll start with the sagittal plane of flexion and extension. Flexion being chin toward the chest and extension as we look up toward the ceiling and really open up the anterior surface, the front surface of the neck and the throat. It's a really important movement. And then we'll go over into the coronal plane of lateral flexion, bringing the ear toward one shoulder and then the other shoulder. This is usually a pretty tight movement, lateral flexion. And it's something that we don't get a lot of in the day, so it's a good warm up, especially before you do anything else related to the neck. Get some movement into lateral flexion. Okay, and then the last one on the transverse plane, we have neck rotation. And as you're trying to get pure rotation, I want you to pin your shoulders back. Don't let them follow you into the movement because we don't want to do trunk rotation just yet. So just rotation through the cervical spine. And most of that rotation comes from very high up in the cervical spine. So now we're moving down into the shoulder joint and the shoulder joint can get a little bit confusing. The shoulder and the hip, those ball and socket joints are more complex than some of the other joints in the body. And that's where the challenge comes. So with the shoulder, we'll start with flexion and extension. So I'm just going to swing around to sideways. Flexion moving up on the sagittal plane. Coming down, I'm moving toward extension. And then when I get to neutral, so here would be anatomical position with my arms, neutral. And then I go back behind the body, we've got extension. Okay, so I'll sweep a few times, maybe doing an inhale as the arms go up and then an exhale as the arms go down. But very often when I go into extension, I actually like to do that with an inhale because you can see this really nice chest expansion that happens. Or sometimes I will squeeze a block. It's one of my favorite upper back strengthening moves. Squeeze a block behind your back. It's very challenging. So you get some strength in extension but it's also working on adduction behind the back. All right, so that's the next one. We're going to open out to the sides and up for abduction of the shoulder, abduction, taking away from the center line. And then we move back into the center line for adduction, adduction. Inhale, sweep up, abduction. And exhale, sweep down for adduction. We can adduct even farther if we cross the center line of the body like that, or like I was saying behind the back, if I really squeeze my arms together, that would be a, a stronger 
adduction with extension. Very often we are doing more than one movement at a time and they're, they're layered together and it might be on multiple different planes of movement like the shoulders can do. Okay, so flexion and extension on the sagittal plane, abduction and adduction, and then for rotation, we can start with just bringing the arms to the sides and I will internally rotate from the shoulder. Be careful you don't get confused with what's happening at the forearm because the forearm can rotate too. We want the rotation up here in the shoulder joint, but you can think about turning your thumb in. That will kind of spiral all the way up the arm to get internal rotation at the shoulder, the glenohumeral joint. And then I'm going to externally rotate and then I think about sending my thumbs out to the sides. That's a cue that I'll give a lot to my students when they're in mountain pose. Roll the thumbs back. Feel that space out through the collarbones and how it tucks your shoulder blades behind your back. And then internal rotation. Okay, so rotation is happening on the transverse plane but if I start to move my arms away from neutral, so this would be rotation in a neutral position, I could come out to 90 degrees of abduction and I could do the same thing. I can internally rotate and then I can externally rotate. And then I can come up overhead and I can externally rotate and internally rotate. That's the one that's the most confusing. So what the shoulder likes the best when we're overhead reaching is external rotation. It loops the arm around, it gives a little extra space at the top of the shoulder joint so there's nothing getting squished. And the way that I get my students to do external rotation overhead is to kind of spiral the pinky fingers in. It makes your hands look kind of neat too. But think about spiraling the pinky fingers in and then lower the arms while they're in that position and what you'll find is you have that like thumb out shape that we were doing in mountain pose when the arms are in neutral. So overhead you're kind of thinking pinky spiral in. When you're down in neutral you're thinking thumb spiral out but that spiral has to go all the way up to the shoulder joint for it to really happen at the glenohumeral joint. One of the other variations that you will see is hands behind the head. I love this one because it really opens up the chest. So this is external rotation of the shoulder. At the same time, we're in abduction of the shoulder and then I have some elbow flexion, some finger abduction. There's a whole bunch of things going on in there. So it gets a little more complicated when we're not doing single pure movements, but that's what you're going to find most of the time in your yoga practice. I could also come out into a cactus. If I was trying to tip my hands back, that would be our external rotation. And then internal rotation is the, the puppet that falls over. The hands drop in, that ball and socket joint rolls in. So inhale, open the arms, external rotation. And then as you exhale, let the arms fall down, internal rotation. Play around with those shoulder movements. They are some of the most confusing. Now before we move past the shoulder itself, I wanna talk about the shoulder blade, the scapula, because the way that the shoulder moves is going to be really dependent on how the scapula is moving. And for us to get really nice flexion or really nice abduction, the shoulder blade has to follow us so the best way to feel this is to actually stand behind somebody, put your hands right onto each scapula, and then ask them to lift their arms up overhead or lift their arms out to the sides and really track how the scapula swings out and up and then swings back down. That is upward rotation of the scapula when the arms lift, especially past 90 degrees, you're going to feel a lot of adjusting in the scapula to allow the arm to go over 90 degrees. And then as the arm comes down, you'll feel the shoulder blades settle back into their resting position. 
we can encourage that movement, that feeling of the scapula gliding along the back of the shoulder blade, letting it be free to slide around on the shoulder blade to allow free arm movement. But it's not a movement that we can isolate like some of the other movements. Just know that that happens. The other interesting movements that we have at the shoulder blades are elevation and depression. And I like to use elevation and depression as a, a warm up movement, especially if I'm targeting tension in the neck and specifically holding. So I'll lift and squeeze really hard, elevate and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze, and then relax. And then activate the muscles that pull your shoulder blades down, like you're trying to tuck them into your back pockets without letting your rib cage pop forward. Keep your ribs neutral. Squeeze down with the shoulder blades like you're trying to lengthen your neck and then relax. So when you relax from scapular depression, your shoulders will pop up a little bit. We don't want them real high, that would be elevation. But try to play around and feel that difference of elevation, maybe give it a little squeeze, and then relax into neutral and see how far can I squeeze my shoulder blades down. That is usually the neglected movement, scapular depression. A lot of people that I see that have shoulder problems, a lot of them have weakness in depressing the scapula. All right, elevation and depression. And then we'll kind of let the shoulders come back into a neutral position. And then we'll look at the other interesting movement that the shoulder blades do, and that is protraction and retraction. It's another movement of the scapula just sliding on the shoulder or on the um, rib cage, on the thoracic cage, sliding forward and then sliding and squeezing back. So this is another one that I like to really emphasize because when you start working into arm balances and inversions and weight bearing on the arms, knowing what your scapula is doing and what muscles are being engaged becomes very helpful. So we're going to protract and you kind of feel your chest muscle squeeze to make that happen and then retract and you feel those upper back muscles squeeze to make that happen and then rest see where your shoulder blades fall to neutral and then we're going to move our way down the arm okay so the elbow this is a nice one it's a hinge joint so we just have flexion as you bend the elbow and extension as you straighten it. Full extension, that's the neutral position for the elbow, full extension, and then we go into flexion. And this is a movement where if I'm trying to get my students to really focus on their breath and I want to pair it with a very simple and easy to do movement, this is a great one. It's just exhale, as you come up and then inhale as you release down. Get that openness or maybe it could be exhale hands to heart and inhale open. But then we start to see some of the movement in the forearm coming into play. And the forearm has two bones that sit parallel to each other. The ulna is from the elbow down to the pinky finger and the radius goes from the outer part of the elbow to the thumb side of the wrist. And the interesting thing about those bones is that they will crisscross. When I turn my palm down, my radius is crossed over the top of my ulna. And that movement is so important because it's what helps us to put our hands down onto the mat into pronation. So we have pronation, putting your hands onto the mat, and then we have supination, where the palms are up, and I always think of holding a bowl of soup because I love soup. Pronation, put your hands onto the mat, and supination, come up. One of the ways that I will incorporate this is you might be crouched down and you can supinate as far as you can, pushing your thumbs out toward the mat, and then I'll pronate. 
and push my thumbs down into the mat on that side. A lot of times the wrists get neglected for some of the biggie, bigger, <laughs> flashier muscles and movements in the body, but the wrists are so important. And we know that if somebody has wrist pain, it can be really debilitating for their practice or forearm pain. So work that pronation, supination, and then we'll go down into the wrist. So the wrist is roughly an ellipsoid joint. So not quite as mobile as a ball and socket, but kind of close. And we'll start with wrist extension and wrist flexion. Pay very close attention to this because I see people switch these all the time. Even therapists <laughs> will sometimes get this one wrong. Extension is bringing the wrist back and it is also how we do weight bearing, wrist extension. Wrist flexion is going down toward the softer or for the hand we'll call it the volar surface of the hand. That is wrist flexion. We use wrist extension way more in yoga because it helps with weight bearing. Sometimes we'll do a wrist flexion stretch where you flip over and you put the dorsal surface of the hand onto the mat. And that's a lovely stretch. It actually feels really good. I feel like I could stay here for a while. And this one is especially helpful if you've been working on the computer a lot. We can also flip over and I'll put my palm onto the mat and I'm in wrist extension, but you see how my hand is facing the opposite way now? That can get a little bit confusing. And it's because I am supinated and going into wrist extension. Whereas if I came up and I pronated and put myself into wrist extension, it would look like that. So that rotation of the forearm makes a big difference in what's happening at the wrist and can definitely get a little bit confusing about what is wrist extension and what is wrist flexion. That's really the biggest thing when you're studying these terms and you learn them in one form, being able to transfer them to other shapes or if all of a sudden the body is upside down like we do a lot in yoga, can you figure out, well, is that wrist flexion or extension? Is that foot dorsiflexion or plantar flexion? And you want to look at the landmarks around the arm. For me, I always know wrinkles in the back of the wrist means extension. I always look for those wrinkles in the wrist. And then I know that I'm working on wrist extension. Okay, the very interesting movement that the wrist does is radial deviation and ulnar deviation. And those are just named for the bone in the forearm that the hand is moving toward. Radial deviation is moving toward the radius, toward the thumb side, and then ulnar deviation is moving toward the ulna or the pinky side. And this is another movement that kind of gets neglected in yoga, but it's a great way to strengthen the outside of the wrist. Where That's where a lot of people will complain of wrist pain, the outside of the wrist here. So I'll put hands down onto the mat and do a little side to side, maybe do it on a blanket sliding the blanket from side to side. And then that leads you into a nice opportunity to work on finger flexion and finger extension. Finger flexion and finger extension. Now, each of the joints in the hand, we could name them if we wanted to say the MP, the PIP, and the DIP, um, or the metatarsal phalangeal, the proximal interphalangeal and the distal interphalangeal, or you could just say finger flexion. And it can be flexion at all of the finger joints. If you're getting into some more complex mudras, that's where uh, you could get really specific about which joint is in flexion and which joint is in extension. The thumb also has a whole range of its own movements. It will do flexion and extension. It also does this very important movement of opposition. It opposes the fingers, and we use that a lot in yoga for mudras for meditation, for focus, and for directing our energy to each of the different fingers. 
And there's this little muscle in here called the opponent's muscle that does opposition. And it's one of the most important muscles in the body. It's tiny, but it's important to us being humans and having the dexterity that we have to manipulate tiny objects. So the thumb has another two movements that are unique. We have radial abduction and adduction, and then we have palmar abduction and adduction. So if the thumb is moving toward the palm, it's palmar abduction, moving away from the palm, palmar adduction, moving toward the palm, radial abduction, moving away from the radius, radial radial adduction moving toward the radius. Those are not the most important movements for you to know. Just know that the thumb is unique because it has a saddle joint and that saddle joint allows movement on two planes instead of just one. All right, so we've got the fingers, the wrists, and the elbows, all of that pretty well.